Welcome to the home of 100 to 1 Faith TV, the place for stories of amazing faith overcoming impossible odds. I'm Larry Gent, and this is the message for Sunday, July 31st, the giveaway. Please join me in a call to worship. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in endless praise. Take my hands and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Amen. Our reading today is from 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of people and of angels, but have not charity, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, if I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, if I have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, if I have not love, it profits me nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. Love does not rejoice in the wrong, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. The Gospel lesson is from Luke 14. Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married so I can't come. The servant came back and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, Go out to the highways and hedges and compel them to come in so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. The sermon text is from Acts chapter 4, and I'll be reading the First Nations version. Stands on the rock, that is Peter, and he shows goodwill or John, went back to their newly formed family and told them what had happened to them and what the council had decided. When the sacred family members heard this, they formed a circle around the message bearers, joined their hearts together, and sent their voices to the Great Spirit. O great Father of the sky above and earth below, of the great waters and all that is in them, they prayed. Hear our cry. Long ago, your Holy Spirit spoke these words through our ancestor, much loved one, David, who served you. The Spirit said, Why did the nations in their great anger make empty threats? 
Why did the people waste their time forming useless plans? The war chiefs of the land took their stand, and the war councils schemed together. But who were they planning to fight? It was against the great spirit chief and his chosen one. The truth of this is plain to see, for right here in the village of peace, or Jerusalem, they gathered together and took their stand against your holy servant, creator sets free, or Jesus. Chief looks brave, Herod, and the spear of the great waters, Pontius Pilate, together with the people of iron, the Romans, and the tribes of wrestles with creator, Israel, did what you in your great wisdom had decided long ago would be done. So we ask you, O great one, look down and see their threats against us. Help us to be brave and tell your story well by performing many powerful signs as we represent your holy servant, creator sets free, Jesus. When they finished praying, the place where they had gathered began to rumble and shake. The Holy Spirit filled them with his power and with brave and strong hearts. They began to tell Creator's story. With one heart and mind, all who trusted in Creator sets free, Jesus, shared their possessions with each other. No one claimed their belongings to be only for themselves. With great power, the message bearers told the story of how their honored chief creator sets free, Jesus, had defeated death and returned to life. Creator's gift of great kindness was covering all of them like a warm blanket, and no one among them was in need. Those who owned houses or land sold them and brought what they had gained to give it to the message bearers to share with everyone. When the Holy Spirit fell upon the early church, something strange happened. They were overcome with the spirit of giving. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about the fact that they were not overcome with the gift of long-term planning, but that doesn't reduce the fact that the Holy Spirit and the spirit of giving always go hand in hand. In Native American culture, that spirit of giving was always considered to be a natural part of living, a way to show honor and respect, a way to celebrate the spirit of thanksgiving, a way to have continual thanks living. The people of the Pacific Northwest, the totem pole people, had the most elaborate giveaway ceremonies called potlatch. Like the man in Jesus' story, they pre prepare a great feast. The whole village was invited, as well as those in neighboring towns. It was a great homecoming celebration, and it went on for days, sometimes weeks. There was storytelling, singing, dancing, the host would tell how his ancestors made his family strong and make gifts to all of his guests, every single one. The giveaways were so lavish that they often bankrupted the host, but no matter. For everyone who came was honor-bound to invite him to their potlatch and do their best to give more than they had received. By giving away everything, the host guaranteed that his family would be rich and have income for years to come. They also guaranteed that the poorest of the community would be cared for. The federal government saw these giveaways as dangerous and primitive. One of the first things they did to civilize those Indians was to outlaw the potlatch. Well, why would the government do that? Well, you might recall back in the 
beginning of Luke's story that Jesus was born in Bethlehem for the convenience of the government. Caesar had a census so he could tell who he could tax. When you go giving away all your property, it makes Caesar nervous. It's too difficult to tell who owns what, and that makes it too complicated to tax. From Jesus' day to our own, and I suspect on into the future, anyone who is dependent on the government is going to have to struggle because they have too little to share. The government creates people of poverty, just barely getting by. God creates a spirit of abundance, a banquet table spread even in the presence of our enemies, with a measure pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. God gives us the power to give, the power of thanks living. That power does not come from a taxable bank account. I have seen that those with the greatest net worth are often the worst at giving and thanks living, while those of limited income are usually the best at giving. That power of giving comes of knowing a God who provides, a God who views us not as paupers, but as king's kids, no matter what the tax register shows. When God provides, you know that you shall not want. God will lead you into green pastures and beside the still waters. The list of things you need gets a lot shorter when you know you have God's abundance in store. There's another native tradition that is about giving, and I think it's also found in the Bible. We make our souls sick when we try to keep things that we do not need. If I have extra shoes while my brother has none, it diminishes my soul to keep them. Giving away those things I do not need does not make me poorer. It makes my soul healthy, and it makes me harder for Caesar to tax. <laughs> These days, I find it easier to embrace that spirit of giving than it used to be. For one thing, I have grandchildren. They can be really good at reminding me how to give. And you know, I don't begrudge it. I, I cannot abide the idea of my grandchildren doing without. Now, I know that they're going to do dumb things when I give to them. I also know that is the only way they're going to learn better. They could learn better by listening to me, but they're not going to. They have to learn by doing. I thank God that he knew the same thing about me. And God has never withheld any blessing for fear I might do something dumb with it. I hope that this is one way that God is making me more into his image. But it's important for me to tell you this. I may be crazy about my grandkids, but God loves you even more than I could ever love them. And God wants you to be able to give. God wants to give to you so you can give in his name. You know, the other thing I've learned about giving is something that comes with age. 
You spend your whole lifetime trying to accumulate enough stuff. But eventually you realize that in a few short years, I'll be moving on. Somebody, probably someone I don't even know, somebody is going to go through my stuff, maybe auctioning it off for a dollar a box, or maybe it just goes straight to the dumpster. Now is the season of my life, of my soul, when I need to be using this stuff to build up treasures in heaven. I need to bless somebody with it while I can so that they can be blessed and I can enjoy the gift of giving. It's not a sad season of life. It's actually a joy to know that I still have plenty to give. John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, had a few words of advice about worldly wealth. Earn all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. I guess it must be sound advice, for Wesley started out as a poor man himself, and in time he became wealthy, selling his booklets for a penny apiece. But I can tell you that he did not count his wealth as a bank account. He counted his value as one who gave away the good news and blessed thousands of souls. So anywhere God is moving, you will find people giving. So let me take the liberty of paraphrasing the father of my church. In this life, Trust God to bountifully supply your every need and give like crazy to show the world that God is crazy about you and has blessed you to be able to give. Hey, it's good for your soul and it makes Caesar nervous. I think both of those are very good things.